Okay, Hi, Maureen. We're ready. Sarah Laughlin. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome to the Bloomington Rotary Club's weekly celebration of service for September 15th, 2020. I'm your current president, Ashley Sullivan. Thank you for being here. Michael, please show the flag graphic for 15 seconds of respectful silence. We ask that everyone remains on mute and take this time to personally reflect. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Hank Heichema, who will be offering our reflection today. Hank? Thank you, Ashley, and welcome, everybody. Um, on September 1, Tim Jessen spoke about how our country is divided, but also how, at least in the religious arena, there is a lot of healing going on. But why are we so divided? And why, for instance, do we not see the same polarization in my country of origin, the Netherlands? So let me briefly contrast the political system in the Netherlands with that in the US. While the US has only two parties with representation in Congress at least, uh, the Netherlands has 15 parties, one five, that are uh, represented in parliament. The government, therefore, is a coalition government with currently four parties delivering ministers. The 15 parties in parliament provide good insight in the political landscape, which spans the gamut from far right to far left, just as in the United States. The largest party is the VVD with 33 from the 150 seats. This party is moderately conservative, but not religiously conservative. The second largest party is the party of Geert Wilders with 20 seats and is to the far right and considered populist. Religious conservatives are found in two other parties with eight seats total. Centrist parties are often religious uh, and somewhat progressive. Leftist parties have a socialist agenda with often an emphasis on environmental protection. Together, these hold around 35 to 40 seats, depending on how you count them. Now, if the Netherlands would have a two-party system, like we have in the US, a conservative and a progressive party, then the populist party of Geert Wilders might very well dominate that conservative party and be in power. We would have Prime Minister Wilders. Because Wilders is rather extreme and outspoken, the Dutch voter would either love or hate their Prime Minister. The Netherlands would then almost certainly appear as divided a country as the US does today. Yet, the underlying political landscape, as we have seen, is quite diverse. If the US would have a multi-party system, our true political plurality, that I believe still exists today, would manifest itself more clearly. Under those conditions, all political voices are heard, and all have their due influence on the way the country would be governed. With more than two parties, party discipline would no longer result in a them versus us political attitude. We would, I think, not be the divided country we appear today. Well, now, the US will not become a multi-party system anytime soon, I think. However, I believe that we are in reality more politically diverse and potentially more tolerant than what we see and experience today. Back to you, Ashley. Thank you, Hank. Always really appreciate hearing diverse perspectives on many issues. Thank you for sharing. Now, uh, to Jim Bright, would you please introduce any visiting Rotarians and your guests for our meeting today? <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you, Ashley. It's uh, always a pleasure to have with us uh, past district governor Sue Wright. Sue is with the Rotary Club of Clarksville, Indiana. Uh, welcome, Sue. Uh, 
Judy Schroeder, uh, I think, has a guest today. Uh, Judy, would you want to introduce your guest? I have uh, Maureen Baker, Maureen Biggers Riley, who is uh, the director of, of Women in Science and Technology. I hope I got that right, Maureen. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Judy. Welcome, Maureen. Uh, Liz Feidel, uh, do you have a, a guest or two? Yes, I have one that I see. I invited others, but I see one. One is uh, Regina Moore, former city clerk and longtime friend, uh, acquired friend. Very, very good labor supporter. She and I always get along. Welcome, Regina. Okay, thank you, Liz. Uh, Regina, always good to see you. Um, I think we have uh, some other guests on here. Um, if you would care to introduce yourself. Uh, uh, Deidre, did you want to say hello? Okay. Um, Deirdre Sheets. Sorry, hi, it took me a sec to unmute there. Um, I'm from Wonder Lab. I don't usually attend. Amy, I believe, is also, is on here. But um, given the topic, I decided to join today. Okay, welcome. And uh, congratulations to you and Amy and the Wonder Lab team on your uh, Science Night In uh, Saturday night. It was uh, a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Okay, I just uh, wanted to recognize some Rotarians we haven't seen a lot of for a while. Uh, Chris Michael Morrison, uh, Michael Wade, Hank Walter, Don Coglazier, Del Brinkman, and Shelly Yoder. So uh, welcome back all, uh, and back to you now, uh, Ashley. Welcome everybody, so good to see you. A little bit of housekeeping. Thanks to our producers, Michael Shermas, Sally Gaskell, and Natalie Blaze for welcoming us so smoothly into this meeting and managing our breakout rooms so that we can have effortless, free, and easygoing conversation before we start our meetings. Thank you. Our roundabout reporter for this week is Glenda Murray. Thank you for giving us our beautiful roundabout that gives us everything we need to synthesize our meetings every week. A few birthdays, Tim Thrasher, September 19th. Brian Price, September 20, and Ron Jensen, September 21st. Happy birthday. One membership anniversary today. CM Morrison has been with our club for one year today. Thank you for joining, CM. Good to see you here today. A few notes on Rotarians in the news. Our own past, immediate past president, Aaron Davis, will speak on Rotary and Peace on September 24th at the North Rotary Club Zoom meeting. So that should be something to look forward to. And Vincennes Rotarians hosted a free lunch for first responders on September 8th. You can see past District Governor Laura Carey with her club in the photo featured in the Vincennes Sun commercial for that great event. That was such a cool idea. The League of Women Voters, Monroe County NAACP, the UU Racial Justice Task Force, and the Women's Monroe County Commission, and Trinity Episcopal Church are hosting two films on Zoom about voter suppression the next two Tuesdays. Rotarian Hal Turner and Monroe County Clerk Nicole Brown will be part of the Q&A following each film. Register to view for free at the link I'm about to add to the chat. And uh, tonight's film is Suppress the Fight to Vote, which chronicles the 2018 midterm election in Georgia. And next Tuesday will be Uncivil War, U.S. Elections Under Siege. This 45-minute film includes a segment on Indiana's fight to reform redistricting. When you register, you will receive the link via email to view the films. Now I'd like to have Sandy Keller give us a quick announcement on voter registration at My Sister's Closet. Okay, Rotarians, next Tuesday, September 22nd, is National Voter Registration Day. There are a few places around town where you can bring guests to get them registered. We will have people at my sister's closet with a tent outside Tuesday all day long, and we will keep our tent up to help people get registered throughout Friday. Anybody that brings a guest or anybody that registers will get an extra 30% off their purchase as a reward. They'll get a sticker saying they registered. We've got all kinds of information and forms, um, but please get people registered. Their vote counts and it's very important. Thank you, Sally. And we'll have an announcement about that in the roundabout this week as well. Okay. 
Uh, now to Sarah Laughlin for an update on the Rotary Toast. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I've got four reasons why you should uh, participate in the Rotary Toast this year. Number one, um, it is our signature, our club's signature event. In fact, it's the signature event of all three clubs in Bloomington. And so because we're Rotarians, we need to be there. We're hosting this party. Uh, number two, it's an opportunity to showcase service above self. We're honoring Bob Hamill this year for his service to our community over many, many years. And um, he richly deserves that. And we need to be present to, to thank him for his service. Third, it's an opportunity to support the food bank, which as you know, is um, probably running double time at this point um, with, with increased need due to the pandemic and so they and they've canceled their book fair so they really need our support and and it's the proceeds from the rotary toast will will go to the food bank so so please help us in that endeavor and fourth it's gonna be fun i mean let's talk about how much fun can you have in the pandemic sitting at home cooking eating alone or eating you know eating your own cooking every single night when you could be enjoying a charcuterie board with your, your husband or wife or maybe a small watch party. And it would be the highlight of your November season. So to purchase a ticket, all you have to do is go to rotarytoast.com and follow the little link right at the very top about purchase a ticket. And there are two prices for individual tickets. One is $100, which of course we encourage you to do, which includes the charcuterie board, or $25 for a view only, for a view only um, ticket. But that's really for people who, Bob Hamill's friends who are out of town. So we hope you as Rotarians will pick the $100 ticket. Or perhaps your business would like to become a sponsor. And if that's the case, there's also information there about sponsoring. So rotarytoast.com, let's boost our member participation in our own party. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. I hope to see everyone there. It's going to be a fabulous time as we've been planning it. It's been a lot of fun to think about all the fun surprises and uh, activities we're going to have during the, during the event. So I hope to see you there. Speaking of volunteering, we have five opportunities available right now, so please take advantage of some of these that we've made available. Our first is Adopt a Road. So our club manages Pete Ellis Drive from East 3rd Street to East State Road 45. We'll have a cleanup day on Saturday, October 24th from 9 to 11 a.m. Please join me to clean up and keep our adopted road beautiful. An email will go out this week so you can sign up for that. Helping Hands is still a viable opportunity. You can help folks in the community that need help with deliveries and things around the house. You can visit helpinghands.civicchamps.com. There's a phone number there. It's always in the roundabout. You can find the information easily. Friends of Lake Monroe, the water sampling blitz that we've been talking about is this Friday, September 18th. There's still some spots available, so sign up at their website, friendsoflakemonroe.org. Wheeler Mission still needs volunteer support, either through directly serving meals or providing sack meals for the shelter. And I believe they're still looking for virtual support for their social media and newsletter development. Reach out to Josie, and that information will be in our newsletter as well. And Teachers Warehouse, volunteers are needed almost every day, Monday through Friday. Please volunteer, volunteers at teacherswarehouse.org. And speaking of Teachers Warehouse, it's time for Happy Dollars. So if you have something happy to share and some dollars to give, it will go directly to support the wonderful efforts of Teachers Warehouse. Anyone? Any happy news? Yes. Ashley, uh, this is Leslie. I'll make a donation to Teachers Warehouse uh, in honor of all the direct support professionals that we have at Stonebelt, this is Direct Support Professionals Recognition Week, and they do a, uh, an amazing job of helping people with disabilities live, learn, work, and play in the community, deserving of our recognition. Okay. Thank you so much, Leslie. This is Charlotte. 
I'm, I'm, I have a happy dollar, let's say 10 happy dollars in celebration of the fact that yesterday afternoon, Michael Glob and I pushed a button to send my, the, the book that we've been writing together to Ingram Press to, to publish it. So yeah. it's, so this is a big moment for me. It's called The Minister's Daughter, A Life and Many Lives. And it will be ready for in, in a print copy in two weeks. I'll let you know. So this is quite a celebration for us. Thank you. Congratulations, Charlotte. Please keep us posted. I will. I have a happy dollar to celebrate Charlotte's new book. And also, I am look, I forgot to say I'm looking for some volunteers for our voter registration booths. So Rotarians, if you're interested in helping out, please contact me. I have a happy dollar um, for Maureen Biggers. Um, she, she is, um, you know, involved in women in tech, but she's also a former um, Rotary Youth Exchange um, alumna, and so she's not unfamiliar with Rotary. We love to have it when she, we love it when she's here. Okay, I have happy dollars for a challenging but successful online gala for Wonder Lab. <laughs> Thank you everyone who participated. Um, yeah, we, we, we met our goal. Wow, congratulations. I, yes, congratulations. This is Glenda. I have some happy dollars in support and thanks to all of the teachers, whether they're teaching in the buildings or whether they're teaching the students who are at home online, they all need our support now as well. Can I do a happy dollar, please? Yes. I wanna do a high five. I'm on the Area 10, uh, uh, <laughs> Area 10 Agency on Aging board and we're having a gift basket raffle going on right now on Facebook. Please go check it out. I mean, even German American, I've got my hundred dollar bill there. So, you know, if you build, if you, if you bid a hundred dollars, you're going to get a hundred dollar bill. And there's five, only five baskets, but we're trying to do some fundraising somehow, some way. So thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Anyone else? I have a I have five happy dollars for Sally Gaskill. Because <laughs> she did something nice for me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Stay tuned for more information. Thank you. <laughs> it's a secret now, but it won't be forever. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Last call for happy. Okay. All right, now uh, I would like to introduce Liz Feidel to introduce our speaker for today. It's my pleasure to be the introducer of Nichelle Whitney. She is the current chair for the Monroe County Women's Commission, which is where I met Nichelle a couple of years ago when she began her work on that commission with us. She's also the founder of The Garden LLC, a place where things can grow. Additionally, Nichelle serves as a faculty <laughs> champion for Black Women in Tech, a student alliance group within the Center of Excellence for Women in Tech at Indiana University Bloomington. She serves as the Senior Assistant Director for Diversity Recruitment and Outreach for Indiana University and also manages Girls Coding Week for Monroe County. She also spends time serving with the Inclusion, Access, and Success Committee for the State of Indiana and serves as a board fellow for the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate that tremendously. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me a nod if we can all see this. Lovely. So Liz did a wonderful job introducing me, so I won't um, bore you with any more details. We'll just go ahead and jump into the program. So today I am here to talk about Girls Coding Camp. It was formerly known as Girls Coding Week, 
but we've made a change because there have been some exciting changes um, that are happening with the 2020 experience. So we'll jump right into it. A little bit of background. So we started Girls Coding Week in 2016. It was birthed from um, an idea from one of the commissioners and essentially what we were aiming to do is give girls hands-on coding experience at the middle school level. So it was a summer camp, our very first camp. We were just hoping to get 15 girls and we actually had a camp of 11. By year two, there was so much traction. The girls had such an amazing experience sharing with their peers and families obviously sharing with each other. We eventually jumped up to needing to host two week long camps in which we actually filled both camps and had a waiting list. So very exciting things are happening within, within Girls Coding Week. A little bit about that format. So the girls would meet Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. They would actually have free transportation to Ivy Tech's campus through our partner Girls Inc. And there they would receive hands-on coding experience. And at the time, we were only able to offer the Scratch curriculum. They also did a number of team building activities. There were scavenger hunts on campus. And then in the second or the third year of the program, we decided let's bring some college readiness information to the girls. So they then started to have lunch and learn opportunities. We were partnered with um, IU admissions. And so we would talk to the girls about the application process. What should they be thinking about as middle school girls getting ready for college? And we also helped them explore some career interests. We had a wonderful opportunity to have CWIT mentors, CWIT being the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. They actually had students that would serve as mentors and interns for the program. So not only did our camp participants get to see, get actual coding instruction, but they got to see it from women that were actually doing this work, had their own journeys, and they got to really build relationships with them. One thing that I love about this experience is been entirely free. And we've been able to do that because we've had amazing partners pull this off. So you've heard me mention Girls Inc. You've heard me mention the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. But we were also partnered, obviously, with the Monroe County Women's Commission, Indiana University Office of Admissions, and Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. So a very robust partnership. In my opinion, someone who loves strategic partnerships, it was great to see community-based organizations, a quasi-government agency, a, a community college, and a four-year institution all partner together for one agenda. And it honestly has been one of the most stressless um, partnerships that I've ever worked with. One thing that I love about the program is that we've been willing to change something every year, even if it worked the year before. So the program is very adaptable to meeting the needs of the students and we get feedback from our participants um, every year about what they enjoyed and what they would like to see the following year. We also have been able to offer um, a closing ceremony in which we've actually had um, Board of Commissioner Penny Githens come and do um, a congratulation to them and, uh, and give them a certificate of acknowledgement saying great work for um, this experience. We would have sweet treats and then we would also invite families into the classroom so that they can see what their students had been completing during their time. The program now, right, so COVID is a thing, and it, we wanted to run it this past summer. However, we were not able to successfully secure funding. So we worked for months on this project, and we came down to the last day, and we decided we're not going to have girls coding anymore. Well, things happened. And I got to meet with the VP of IT for Ivy Tech, Dr. Linda Calvin. She and I brainstormed and we decided, why not turn it into an after-school program? And why not officially partner with the school districts? And now that it's virtual, we don't actually have a limited capacity of 15 people, right? So guess what Michelle did? Huh. I called MCCSC and RBBSC and I said, we want to bring this program formally to your districts and help you embed this as part of um, the program of study for your students. And so that is what we have officially done 
for 2020's experience. We are now having an after school program that will run for five weeks, beginning October 12th and ending November 13th. It will run from 3.45 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. and it will all be virtual. We'll house it in a Google Classroom. So our intention behind that is giving the girls the ability to network with each other, to build community with each other, but also for them to, within their district and across districts. It will still be a Monday through Friday program, but we have a new format. So on Mondays, we will do what we call Monday Motivation. This is where girls will get to meet with professionals in the industry. They'll get to meet with um, college professionals from Ivy Tech and from IU to talk about what are your educational opportunities? What should you be thinking about? Where can coding take you? Then on Tuesday and Thursday, they will still receive tailored coding instruction. What we're particularly excited about is this is facilitated by Ivy Tech faculty but co-facilitated with the Center of Excellence for Women in, Tech in Technology interns. So they'll actually get to have women co-facilitating their coding instruction. Wednesdays, we'll kind of give them a break, a midweek break. We'll let them get through the hump day and then we'll come back on Friday, which we're terming Fabulous Fridays. And that's when they really get to connect with their mentors and do some of this social emotional learning and skill building that we would have been able to do with them in person. The Fabulous Fridays are actually hosted by the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. Again, it's all virtual. We'll still have our CWID interns. The program is still entirely free. And in addition to their mentor um, from the center, they'll also have a college and career mentor, which are women in the community that have said, we're interested in serving as mentors. We're particularly excited that our opening key, um, keynote speaker on October 12th is Jane Martin. And so the girls are gonna get to hear from someone who's actually invested in this type of work and seen where technology can take you. This year, we had such an interesting experience. So we were approached by Ivy Tech and Ivy Tech said, hey, we were invited to apply for a Verizon grant. The grant is in the amount of $25,000 and we want to partner and give it to Girls Coding. Now, I just told you we've run this camp in kind for years. So imagine when I saw $25,000, my eyes lit up. I'm like, all the things that we could do. And so we collectively um, submitted this grant and Verizon actually came back and instead of us getting the 25,000, we got $50,000 for Girls Coding Camp. So we now have funding beyond what we've ever imagined and what that allowed us to do was then to start a track within Girls Coding Camp for brown girls who code. So one thing we've done in the past for the cohort between 2016 and 2019 is because we knew that seats were limited, we tried to really focus in on families that were eligible or qualified for free and reduced lunch, okay? We wanted to make sure we were giving experiences to students that perhaps may not have been exposed to them already. So now we're looking at Brown Girls Who Code, which is a track embedded within Girls Coding Week. But what it does is give them access to black and brown women who are in the industry or, or industry adjacent positions. It gives them additional mentoring opportunities. And the girls from Brown Girls Who Code will actually get to go home with the full Raspberry Pi bundle and receive additional coding instruction. So they'll receive 19 inch monitors, and they'll receive the Raspberry Pi and they'll have additional tailored curriculum for that experience. So we're really excited about 2020. I want to highlight the partners. One, this work absolutely cannot be done without the commissioners. These commissions are lifted, listed in alphabetical order and you'll see three down at the bottom with asterisks. Well, they were commissioners and no longer serve with us but were integral to the success of the camp. So I recognize and I honor them as well. But then I wanna give a special shout out to all of our additional partners. So again, Indiana University Office of Admissions, just a wonderful partner as far as providing um, college readiness information, mentor support. Uh, last year they hosted Lunch and Learn, so they provided lunch for the girls for both weeks. Um, we are officially partnered with Edgewood Schools and Monroe County. Um, community school corps. So that is really important because they will be integral in recruitment. 
They will be sending this out in newsletters, connecting with families, and they're really going to be kind of boots on the ground to help support us um, with the camp. One thing that we ran into this year, we knew that we needed the technology to be able to offer to the camps. And that was one significant funding limitation that we had. So we were in a series of meetings and we knew that MCCSC had iPads and tablets that they would send home with the girls, but we knew that RBB did not have the iPad. So we were in a frenzy. We didn't know how we were going to get the coding instruction equally to both schools. One reason why I immensely appreciate our partnership with Ivy Tech is because their faculty jumped on board and said, we'll run two separate curriculums to meet the technology need of both districts. So our RBB students will actually be having a scratch experience, which complements their coding curriculum and their computer science program. And our MCCSC students will be running Swift Playground, which is loaded automatically to their Apple iPad. So both school districts will get tailored um, curriculum and will have the materials that they need. The other things the school districts have um, been integral in doing is saying that, hey, if a student has a challenge with their technology, we are covering that. We'll make sure that the student continues to have the supplies that they need. And so we appreciate that. We are obviously thankful for Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. Um, they have been a partner since the beginning, offering many times swag items and different um, resource items for the girls, including mentorship and complimentary um, Girl Scout membership. So we are so appreciative of that. And then of course, Verizon for taking us to new heights in 2020. So the purpose, why do we do any of this? Why do a girls coding camp? One thing that sticks out to me so often is this quote. Oh no, I'm skipped. Um, this quote, when I look back at my younger self, I would tell myself to be confident first and foremost, to believe in myself before anyone else, because if I believe in myself, then others will too. And ultimately this confidence and belief in myself would enable me to enable other women around the world. It's about believing in your goals and what you are passionate about. And from that, others will become passionate about it too. And that is from the founder of Mogul. And I think it's really important that we think about sometimes we don't think about empowering girls at the middle school level to pursue or to start thinking about their college and career interests or their academic interests. And this is just really important because this girl's, this girl's coding camp gives them that opportunity. They get mentors um, that empower them that they see in the field. And we try to really get mentors that look like them. So we have a very diverse set of mentors. But then also just knowing that um, when I talked to MCCSC, one thing that their STEM coordinator told me was that we have a lot of resources available for the um, K through five group and for our high school group, but our middle school group could really use some support. And so we're happy that this program is formally filling in that gap. We also believe um, as a commission, but also as partners working on this project, that it is our job to create access. So we create access to people through mentorship. We're helping these girls build their networks before they even know that they need networking, right? We're giving them access to education through mentorship. And so you'll see that mentorship is an essential component of this program. We are giving them access to opportunities through tech literacy and instruction. And when I was looking over, like, what does the Rotary believe in? What are some core values? I saw that you guys also believe in um, education literacy. Our goal is to center inclusion. So one thing that happened is we had this amazing planning team. All of the things are moving at a very rapid speed. Things are coming together really well. Everyone had a plan. And then one day we were at a meeting and I looked at my partners and I said, this is amazing work. We're excited that Ivy Tech faculty are facilitating the curriculum. This is great. Where are the women that are facilitating the curriculum, right? And so we looked up and there were two white men that were going to be given the curriculum, the coding instruction. And so I said, how do we diversify this? What I love about our faculty at Ivy Tech, they were absolutely on board. They agreed. They were like, duh, we were going to tell you. We just didn't know how to say it. I'm like, well, you can just say it to me. I'm pretty open book. So that led to opportunities for our CWIN interns to be able to do co-facilitated instruction. So we center things on inclusion. We're not erasing one particular demographic or population. We're trying to figure out 
how to center this group of girls to get the maximum support they need. And again, I'll say it again and again until I'm blue in the face, mentorship is essential. A little bit about the Monroe County Women's Commission. The commission, we serve in an advisory capacity and our role is to essentially to assist residents, businesses, and the government of Monroe County in addressing issues of gender equity in all aspects of society. And so we, while we are termed a women's commission, we believe that we must support our girls as well. And so we've looked at as a women's commission also having um, an intern. And an intern could be a high school student or a younger, but we look at how do we bring girls into conversations about the quality of conditions here for them as well. And this is what we aim to do with Girls Coding Week. Our core values, which we have developed over a series of retreats and conversations, include trust, honor, justice, kindness, accountability, and transparency. And so this is how we model the work that we do. So at that time, at this time, I mean, I didn't have a very long presentation, but I do welcome any questions that you may have about the program, about the strategic partnerships, about the commission, anything at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nichelle. Can you hear me? No. Yes, yes. I can hear you. Oh, okay. I, my question is, I'm, I'm an I'm old and so I don't know what coding is. And I wonder how the girls find out what coding is and why they should be interested in it. That's a great question. This is why it was really important for us to partner with the school. So both school districts are having conversations and many, some of them have um, actual courses within their STEM um, classwork about coding. So they're getting some of this computer science education but it's not very robust in, in it's not hands on all the time. And so we're, we partner with them because we know that the school districts are already having conversations with students about the importance of coding. So that's one way that they get it. But the other thing is coding really kind of exists everywhere. I'm gonna age myself a little bit, but I remember back in the day when I had a MySpace page and I could change all the filters and make the graphics animated and move. I didn't know that was coding. I just thought I was adding Tweety Bird as a backdrop that could fly around, right? But that was really coding. And so it's exciting to see that some of the things that the students are doing now on social media and as they're developing TikToks and they're able to edit all the things online, they're really getting access and experience with coding. They just don't know that's what it's called. So we're kind of helping formalize that by taking them through some, some unique programming. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Michelle, you may want to unshare your screen just so we can uh, have you with this. So, sure. I have a question for Michelle. Hi. I'm Connie. My husband Gus and I have found this wonderful Netflix show that you've got to see if you haven't seen it about a woman coder. It's called Halt and Catch Fire. Have you seen it? No, but I'm Googling it now. Google it. It's, I don't think it's appropriate for the kids because oh, okay. there's you know, sex in it. But you, you know, adults, it's just wonderful about women coding. Nice. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. Loved your presentation. So exciting for these girls. Thank you, Connie. Yes, thank you. This is Glenda. You talked about in the beginning, four years ago, you included, um, you worked with Girls Inc. as well, but it, I didn't hear you mention them when you talked about the partners in the current iteration since you've worked with, you're now working with both school corps, et cetera. Do I have that right? Yes, that is correct. So we're not formally partnered with Girls Inc. for this year's program. I just, I'm the recorders or the <laughs> newsletter person, so I want to be sure I don't misspeak. Thanks. Gotcha. Thank you, Glenda. Any other this, questions? Yes, this is Jim Sims. How are you? Hi, Jim. I'm Good so to see sorry. You. I'm, I'm in so many Zoom meetings. I'm used to just sitting there with my hand up. So I think <laughs> I'll just go. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, and I think you might be aware of some coding school um, training that's being held at the mill mm -hmm. um, with Pat East and his group. Um, do you are you all connected any way with that, or is there a partnership either currently or looming? 
That is a great question. So we are partner with the mill, but not for their um, coding school per se. The mill generously donated their event space for us to be able to open, to offer an open um, floor plan presentation opportunity for families that would want it. So on November 14th, and I share this loosely right now because details are still being developed, but for families who are interested, we're going to give their girls an opportunity to come to the mill It'll be limited invites, so they'll be able to invite two family members and their mentor, but the girls will be able to give a presentation about what they've learned, what they experienced in Girls Coding, um, and why it was a good program for them. Again, that's as desired, it's completely optional, but the mill has completely donated their space and their time for that. So we are a partner with them, but not for the coding school. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions or thoughts? Michelle, this is Liz. What's been your favorite part of the whole thing? <sighs> My favorite part? Um, probably is managing the partnerships. Because, I mean, let's just be transparent. There is a lot of bureaucracy that can happen with partnerships, we can get into the town and gown conversations and, and all the things, but this has honestly been one of the most healthy and fruitful partnerships. Everyone is so open to serving the girls. And so my favorite part is seeing how everyone authentically shows up to meetings, they contribute and how the program goes from barely being able to hold 11 girls to now having access to upwards of 700, right? That is because Wonderful. of the partnerships that we have. And that is my favorite part because I love bringing people together. And so when it comes together and the initiatives are successful, I do it time and time again. I am that going is, to take a really is, long nap when this is over though. <laughs> that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. question. Um, I, you can't see my picture, which is just fine. Um, the, uh, do you ever have girls who want to repeat or do you have a sequential kind of course? Yes. So we always have girls that want to repeat, but unfortunately we try not to have repetition because we don't have a robust program that will pipeline students into the next opportunity. So we don't, so here's the thing, if you get a Raspberry Pi in year one, we don't want to fund a Raspberry Pi for you in the second year or the third year as well. But what we do try to do with our students is for those who are interested in returning, we try to invite them back as mentors. So now you're a girl who's already gone through the camp. You're a peer at that point, right? You're likely the same age. So we try to bring them back and engage them um, and allow them to connect with the girls. But we have not built out a pipeline that will get them from girls coding camp into their next experience. We're open to that feedback. We just haven't done it yet. Michelle, we had a question in the chat about what is Raspberry Pi. Could you explain that to folks that don't know? Okay, so here's the thing, friends. I am a tech adjacent professional. I support tech. I am not in tech. What I can explain loosely and from my tech people that are on the call, correct me if I'm wrong, so there's a monitor that comes with it that allows you to essentially be able to um, code and like develop instruction within this miniature robot, I will say, that allows you to achieve a certain number of tasks on the computer monitor. So I would think of it, the best way I can explain is like a miniature robot that you get to do coding on and then it pops up on the screen. I probably should go through the camp and get some of this coding instruction so I have a better answer next time. <laughs> well, then this is Glenda again. You may not want this question either, but um, <laughs> in addition to the Raspberry Pi, which Maureen very kindly said it's a mini computer, but plugs into this monitor. There you go. You mentioned something about RBB is doing the Scratch curriculum and MCCSC is doing Swift Playground curriculum. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about either one of those and what's involved or? Yeah, I'm not even going to try to pretend to do <laughs> that, okay. Linda. Okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> what I can say is that um, all the curriculum is free. 
we did get to meet with um, Apple. So Apple jumped on a call with us to kind of explain Swift Playground and take us through some simulations. I am not your tech person. I wish I would have had my tech colleagues jump on this call with me because they could have talked about it all day. That's okay. But it sounds like Swift Playground is an Apple yes. curriculum. Yes. And I gather Scratch is not. Right. And Scratch okay. will be run through Google Chromebooks. Okay. Thank you. That I am helps. happy to follow <laughs> That's how up. I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to follow up and get additional details about it and share it back with Liz so that she can share it to your group. Okay. Also, Thanks. Is there anything on a website or anything that we could just dig deeper ourselves into learning more about the program? So we do not have a website, um, but I can send you all the flyer and contact information for me if you have any additional questions. We do not have a website nor a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're kind of word of mouth in it right now. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Well, your audience is those junior high girls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you very much. This was very interesting. Is that one of the differences between what's happening at the mill and what's happening in the schools? Is the mill doing junior high school, junior high kids, or is it more adults? I'm actually not sure about the mill's program. Yeah, I think, I think my understanding was the mill was more for adults. Jim Sims, do you know? I think you're absolutely correct, and they have yeah. limited numbers um, yeah. with some planning. Um, actually, the next experience is uh, to fill actual jobs and create yeah. actual yeah. employment opportunities, yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You're welcome. There's a lot of great things being shared with me in the chat, so if I look like I'm not focused, <coughs> I am trying to take these notes before I end this call. Thank you guys for sharing these resources. Good. Well, if we don't have any further questions right now, um, we will formally close our program. Nichelle, do you have a few minutes to stay after in case any more questions come to mind? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. In honor of your presentation today, we'll be making a donation to the Teachers Warehouse, which supports teachers in our community with essential supplies. And um, we're so happy to have you here and looking forward to the next steps beyond 2020. So awesome. keep it Awesome, cool. thank you. Um, to introduce next week's program, Sally Gaskell. I am here. Okay, yes, next week our speaker is Bloomington's own Jessica Hain, and she'll be giving her annual address to our club as the new district governor of our Rotary District. and. Looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing how we respond to Jessica. Usually when the district governor rises to the podium to give his or her address, we all stand. What are we gonna do, people? <laughs> <laughs> we can stand. Very enthusiastic thumbs up. We can we can come up with something. Great. Good point. <laughs> Next, Jessica Hain. Thank you. Okay. It will also be our club assembly, so we'll have some important updates on what's going on with Rotary and with our club, and I have some special announcements to make, so be here. Okay, Michael, would you please share the four-way test graphic for us? We'll close the meeting by reciting it together. Okay, things, 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 Second. 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 Is it fair to all concerned? Third. 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 Will and better friendships. Fourth. And fourth. Will it will be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth. Is it fun? Thanks again, Michelle. Officially closed. Thank you, Michelle. Has any further questions? Please ask now. Nichelle, is there anything else you'd want to talk about with the um, program or, or you think you've pretty much covered it right now? Um, you know, I think we pretty much covered it, especially with 
uh, your members asking additional questions. Yeah. Uh, again, okay. if something comes up in the midnight hour well, and you just are burning to know, please feel free to email me. I'll actually drop my email in the chat for you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And then I think keep in mind also, this is the first year of the partnership with the two school systems and this initiative. So more will be probably come about as that is evaluated and see how it went for succeeding years. It'd be my guess, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And Michelle, then, I was just gonna ask about uh, communication. Uh, is it through the administration, through the teachers, to the students uh, by and large? Yes, so we have a multi-pronged approach to getting this word out. So Ivy Tech will be sharing this via their Center of Lifelong Learning's um, webpage and also with middle school students that have completed their camps and programming. IU Admissions is um, actually has it listed on our pre-college program page. So for families that are interested in finding a pre-college camp or after-school initi um, initiative connected to IU, it already is live there. And then we have within admissions, we have a counselor database for our middle schools. So we'll be sending it out to them as well. Because we're formally partnered with the school district and their STEM coordinators, they will be sending out emails um, directly to parents. They'll also be sending it out in newsletters and directly to the STEM teachers at the school. So we're gonna try to hit as many bases as possible in addition to posting it on social media. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So initially we were going to um